Danielle, and welcome to Data Science Conference Europe 2022. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, you have a PhD from the Max Planck uh, Institute for Mathematics and Sciences. Uh, you have worked as a researcher, as a lead mathematician, as a director of machine learning at RNG, and now you're working as head of machine learning and R&D at the BBC. So can you tell us a bit more about your development path and why you entered into the field of AI research? Yes, well, um, as, as you rightly said, I'm a mathematician by, by trade and I've always been since I was like, since I, I've become a conscious almost. Uh, so at one point uh, during my PhD, uh, when you start with this kind of academic, um, when you start doing mathematics academically and as a professional, it just becomes more and more abstract and you end up in this kind of almost alleys of mathematics which are very confined uh, with a confined problem set with a small group of people and you are literally researching uh, a very abstract form of a very abstract problem which is completely detached from reality and we used to say um, in this mathematics community when we would touch upon something uh, that is slightly motivated by the real world application we would call it the uh, real world problem as if we were like dealing in this uh, in this artificial abstract world uh, all the time which was actually the true the truth so after my phd i've uh, slowly uh, started uh, drifting towards applications more and more through to postdocs uh, and then just um, you know it was the most uh, the most logical uh, next step in a way uh, to, to, to apply uh, my knowledge and um, um, problem-solving ability on something that could be more impactful and has a faster feedback loop. And I think that can yeah. be faster than the, uh, mathematics. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a field as vast as machine learning, what are some of your passions uh, in it? Well, um, yeah, I love uh, I love many many um, aspects of machine learning. For example, um, uh, natural language processing and new advancement in this area is truly astonishing. And um, as well as data representations uh, that kind of came from this natural language processing field, uh, it is also one of the unexpected developments. And it's just it seems that that we are constantly surprised what can be achieved with these large models when you give them enough data to learn from. Um, so yes, I'm a, because I also come from AIG where I had the, a kind of a little bit of finance background, uh, we did a lot of stuff with semi-interpretable machine learning models because when you need to use, when you're kind of using AI and ML to kind of um, uh, outsource decision-making to a model, and this decision is going to have impact on millions of dollars or pounds, then you cannot rely on a black box. So it has to be kind of uh, some form of interpretable models in a way. So, so that was also one of my big interests, semi-interpretable machine learning models. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. All very exciting fields, mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, your talk here at the conference was of applications of AI in news and media. So could you go a bit into what you talked about and what are some of your main themes that you covered? Yeah, well, um, I kind of started a talk with, uh, uh, with the line from uh, uh, a poet, Branko Milkovic, poetry will be written by everyone. And we are at the stage where everyone is using AI. You know, everyone is doing something with the data um, and making database decisions and so on. So I focused my talk on what we do uh, in BBC. Um, so I've talked a little bit about the uh, work that we've, we've done on a BBC archive. So it's a huge collection of data uh, and videos and uh, documents and uh, audio, audio and you know different type of content and there is some estimate that what we have in the archive is equivalent to 100 years of HD video. Uh, so it's a huge vast uh, amount of data but it was locked because you could not search it in a way so we had to transcribe it using the internally uh, belt tools because uh, to transcribe such a vast collection of data you would have to spend millions and millions of pounds which is simply unsustainable for us 
and then we would um, we, we we had to use uh, natural language processing on top of these strong scripts to to actually extract metadata, to extract tags, to uh, add labels, um, and um, yeah, and then we had to restore it. So the recent work that we're doing is uh, a restoration pipeline. So you have a lot of these noisy, uh, blurred images with physical damages, scratches, uh, black and white, and um, our latest work is on you know denoising, uh, deblurring, uh, resolution enhancement, and then colorization using uh, AI machine learning tools. Um, yeah, so that was basically uh, mm -hmm. the majority of my talk. Ah, uh, quite interesting. Uh, what are some of the main advantages and disadvantages of using large uh, language uh, models? And in your opinion, what is the future of uh, NLP? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure that I'm best placed to answer that, but uh, <laughs> we, I think there are a lot of advantages. So, for example, one of the uh, experiments that we've done in BBC is uh, we've uh, fine-tuned one of the open source models, GPTJ, on, uh, on vast amounts of BBC news articles. And these models like perform amazingly well. Like they pick the structure, the style of BBC, and uh, uh, it's just incredible. And we primarily use it as a sort of a tool to help us represent our content better, and then use it in downstream tasks. So these large language models are very good. Uh, in a sense, they kind of figure out similarities. They figure out the re good representations of the content, and that's very valuable when you kind of have a recommendation engine downstream and need to use kind of good metadata, good representations. Um, what are the, and what was the second one? It was about the, uh, the future of uh -huh. NLP and where yeah. do you see it progressing? Mm -hmm. Well, some people criticize like NLP at the moment. They say, well, it's just a statistical, uh, it's a bunch of statistics. It doesn't have any intelligence, so, like it's not intelligent and so on. But who is to say that our intelligence is not only statistics, but a, you know, slightly maybe different, maybe with more uh, uh, more parameters, maybe, you know, it's, um, uh, I'm not sure. I think, uh, you know, everything is moving towards the transformer. Uh, I mean, everything's already a transformer in machine learning, and it seems to have been so for quite a while. Uh, and uh, it would be interesting to see uh, what's coming next. I, I, I honestly cannot even start guessing. <laughs> well, whatever comes next, I'm mm -hmm. sure it will be uh, exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and to end the interview, what is your main takeaway from Data Science Conference? And what do you see as the benefit of these types of conferences in general? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> well, uh, one, um, one main takeaway, as I was saying, is that everyone writes poetry nowadays. So, so you know, it's everywhere. Everyone wants to, wants to be data literate. Everyone wants to use new techniques and, you know, solve big business problems and so on. But it's also very tricky because these models are as good as our data is. And sometimes, and this is what I've learned in AIG, sometimes human intelligence uh, is much more valuable. And especially like when it comes to these niche uh, decisions uh, than to one that can be picked up by model because you cannot simply input everything uh, into a model. And even if you could, uh, it would be a difficult uh, task to optimize in a sense. So, yeah, I mean, I, I truly enjoyed uh, some of the talks. Uh, there's been a huge variety, um, different, different topics, different, uh, different applications and so on. So it's a valuable experience for me, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for attending the conference. I do hope you've mm -hmm. enjoyed it so far and that we might be able to see you next year as well. Yes, thank you.